This program was made with the support of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. Saint Colin Banas. He was this great saint who came from Ireland. Colin Banas. His name means dove. Truly, never was any man less like a dove than Colin Banas. Colin Banas was Sir John the Baptist in Europe. And he had the guts to say to Frankish kings, "Put your house in order morally." A great Isaiah, a great Jeremiah, and a great John the Baptist. What better could you get than that? He was a great prophet. And it was amazing that he had faith enough to stand up to these people who were the most powerful of their day. He told the French bishops he was right. He criticised the bishops. Columbanus was a man of singular thought. He was not loved by a lot of people. I have to say, in power, but he he, he was the one that succeeded in the end.、So. Columbanus was his own man to the end. He had a message to say. He had a message to give, and he was going to give it no matter. And no king or no queen or nobody else was going to stop him from doing so. I'm Paul Wright, and welcome to the tenth program of Back from the Brink, the series which investigates the role of the early medieval Irish in helping to save Western civilization. In our last program, we heard how the Irish monk Columbanus of Bangor left his native Ireland in and around the year 590 AD to establish monasteries in the land of Gaul, nowadays called France. Within a few short years, Columbanus's Irish monasteries in France became renowned for their learning and piety, with thousands flocking to them. Yet, despite this success, Columbanus's work was vehemently opposed by local Frankish bishops. Bangor local historian Ronnie Nesbit. Like most successful things, it probably attracted a deal of attention from those who perhaps were jealous of its success. Uh, perhaps、um, the very austerity and piety of Columbanus、uh, threw into stark relief、um, the laxness of many of the, the religious observances of the local bishops. That aside, there probably were other issues about the, the fact that monasteries were independent; they could set up where they wanted to, and bishops didn't like people setting up monasteries in their area without asking permission. But Columbanus was. wasn't too fussed about doing that. He had brought his own bishop from Ireland anyway, so he didn't need them. And again, that would have really put the cat among the pigeons. Columbanus and his monks they came into conflict at this stage with with the local bishops who had been there beforehand. Glasgow-based early medieval historian David Trainer. And the local bishops they found three things. That really annoyed them about Columbanus and his monks. First one was that Columbanus and his monks were following an Irish calculation of the date of Easter. It seems a bit trivial to us, you know, just one feast day. But if you think about it, the date of Easter was important because it actually meant five weeks before that, from Ash Wednesday, the fasting that took place before it, and then the celebration of Easter, which was seven seven weeks. A week of weeks, as it were, the fifty days of the, the Pentecost, fifty days celebrating it. So you're talking about a hundred days. It's a long part of the year, and if that was done at a, a different time, it would mean that, for example, their monks would be would be having festivities on Easter week, while the others in the other churches would be still having their Holy Week and so on. So there was this clash. So that that be that became a bone of contention. The penitential discipline didn't go down well with the local bishops, who tended to go hunting, and they liked their money and they liked their wine and their food. And also, Columbanus would just build these monasteries without any authority, and this was undermining the authority of the local bishops as well. In comes this Irishman without asking anybody's permission except the king's. Doesn't ask their permission to. Start monasteries and, as it were, lay down the law in his particular bit of the church. K. Tristram, early medieval historian and also author of the celebrated book on Columbanus's life, called Columbanus: The Earliest Voice 
of Christian Ireland. But in particular, they find that he is teaching customs which are contrary to their customs. Now, when they invited him to a synod, most probably it was to tell him the right way to observe the festival of Easter, which they thought he was doing wrongly because he, they thought the Irish were calculating the date of Easter wrongly and so on. They wanted to bring him into line. And Colin Barnes, of course, senses this. So he writes a letter which would have been not so much in their Latin as in his Latin, but very good Latin, all the same. And he says, look, we are doing nobody any harm. All that we are asking for is to be left alone. For goodness sake, leave us alone. We intend to continue to follow the traditions of our ancestors. Because Colin Barnes, you see, would never have been used to bishops who looked upon a particular piece of territory as their territory. That wasn't the way it was in Ireland, right? And he would not, not have met men of this aristocratic type before. Being the kind of man he was, Colin Barnes, yeah, you know, he said, you have to come to this. And he said, it was like kind of saying, well, just watch me and see if I come. And he refused to go. Historian David Trainer. But he sent him a letter and it was a really, it was a really cheeky letter in the sense that he says, I'm glad to see that you're, that you're meeting at last. He says, it's a pity you don't do this more often, you know. <laughs> and this didn't go down well with the bishops. To the holy bishops, priests and remaining orders of the Church of Gaul, I, Columbanus, the sinner, send greetings in Christ. I give thanks to my God that for my sake so many holy men such as yourselves have gathered together to treat of the truth of faith and good works and, as befits such, to judge of the matters under dispute with a just judgment through senses sharpened to the discernment of good and evil. Oh... Would that you did so more often. Any letters he wrote were in the form of uh, the time where the first few sentences would have been quite flowery and very nice and then he would have uh, floated off into a very, uh, quite a nasty tirade of words against who he happened to be writing to. And although uh, Patrick earlier had written to Caroticus with some very harsh words, there were nothing to the sort of words that Columbanus would have used. Bangor local historian Tom Bowl. And historian David Trainer also had this pertinent comment to make. He said, I'm not coming to your council because I'm staying here. I'm at peace with 17 of my dead brethren, as if he was in a cemetery. But that whole notion there, there you've got, after just a few years there, 17 of his monks have died. So these people have come from their native land, they've become exiles for Christ, pilgrims for Christ, and they've died. And Columbanus was very conscious of the fact that these men had in fact given their lives to this. And here were these bishops squabbling about a detail about a liturgical, a liturgical feast. One thing, therefore, I request of you, holy bishops of Gaul, with peace and charity, bear with my ignorance and, as some would call it, my arrogant insolence in writing to you. Necessity, not pride, is the cause of it, as my own worthless self proves. It is for our common Lord and Saviour that I have come to these lands as a pilgrim. I beseech you, therefore, by our common Lord, to allow me, with your peace and charity, to remain in silence in these woods, and to live beside the bones of my seventeen dead brethren, just as, up till now, we have been allowed to live twelve years among you. He is both confrontational and also quite uh, conciliatory. Historian Kate Tristram once again. 
He does, on the one hand, say, look, I don't want to come. Why don't I want to come to this meeting? Because if I came, I should just lose my temper. And the Bible tells us not to lose our tempers, so I won't come. <laughs> but he also, uh, uh, and he, he's, he, he tries to say, all that I'm asking for is to be allowed to be, to, to continue to be Irish, even though I'm now among the Franks, uh, and not to have other people telling me the way I should live the Christian life, because I want to live it as I was taught it in Ireland. But he is confrontational because at one point he says, now we monks, you know, are living the gospel life. We are seeking the kingdom of heaven. And then he actually says to these bishops, wouldn't you like to seek the kingdom of heaven? Well, you can, you know, if you live the gospel life just as we are living it. And you can just imagine this letter being read aloud at the synod. And it would have been the sort of thing that these highly born and highly educated men had never heard in their lives before. So I think they would have found it confrontational, yes. They didn't, though, make any attempt to dislodge him, but I think that there was a political reason for that. So long as Columbanus had the friendship of the kings, that was the really important political factor. If the kings were supporting him, the bishops would not have had the power to have done anything to suppress him. However, he then, unfortunately, quarrelled. Now, the man who writes his biography put this all down to the evil queen, Brunhild. <laughs> she was uh, apparently, in his view, she was the cause of all the troubles. And regarding Columbanus' confrontation with the Queen Mother, Brunhilde, historian David Trainer shares his views. The story of Brynhilde would make a great movie. You know, it's, uh, she's a real kind of dragoness, as I say. She's um, she's the queen mother. She's the grandmother of these princes who were to, to become the kings of the various kingdoms. Brynhilde invited Columbanus to come and to bless four of her grandchildren who were to be the future kings. And uh, Columba comes along, but he refuses. He says they were begotten in sin. There's no way I'm going to bless them. So that didn't go down well with Brunhilde. And she was a force to be reckoned with, you know. The other one was the king. Th we, we, the modern word for his name would be Thierry, like the famous footballer Theoderic. And he was the, he was the king, and he invited Columbanus to come to the court and Columbanus comes to the court and the king has laid out this beautiful big table with all these goblets of wine and, and dishes of this beautiful food and um, Columbanus just scatters the whole thing smashes the goblets, smashes the dishes and all that, you know because he's really opposed to all this opulence and all that, that didn't get down well either Another reason for the quarrel is said to have been that the king having granted the land to Columbanus, very reasonably thought that the monastery was his. <laughs> so he came and wanted to be shown over the monastery. And uh, Columbanus said, yes, we will show you the public bits of it, but not the bits that are private for the monks. Oh, said the king, I want to see the whole of it. <laughs> you see, again, there was a clash between the Christian customs and the customs of the Franks, which would have looked upon that monastery as belonging to the king rather than belonging to the abbot. <laughs> anyway, one way or another, Columbanus realised that he, he was getting to be unpopular. So between that and between the animosity that he'd, he had fomented among the, the, the local bishops of the area, eventually he was exiled, he was told to leave. Historian David Trainer. So what was it like for Columbanus to be exiled? Historian Liam Briggs of the North Down Museum based in Bangor, County Down. Obviously it would be terrifying because these monks had... They didn't have the weapons. They were armed with nothing but their faith and they had to walk away. And again, they were walking into another country. They didn't know where. They didn't know if the next king was going to be in any way supportive of what they had. They had no idea of where the next bits of food were coming from. Again, it was the faith got them through. Um, it would be a horrible thing. Imagine leaving a country that you had made some foundations in, that you had 
spent a huge amount of time. Um, Colin, Colin Bass had grown into an older man here as well. He'd spent 20 years here. It was his life. He had got by. Imagine walking away from that. I suppose people do in, in war-torn countries. It's that sort of an idea, really, that you walk away from everything that you've made. So Colin Bannis and his Irish brethren after 20 years establishing monasteries and working in that land, now it is called France, were being forced into exile. So just how did their journey of exile go? Bangor historian Ronnie Nesbitt. Well, it didn't go very well because the soldiers who went the first time somehow couldn't find Columbanus, which was strange. And the next lot couldn't. And the, lo- the last lot who was sent, finally realising that their life was on the line, pleaded with him to go with them. And it was uh, out of compassion that finally he conceded. And he and his original 11 companions made the lonely 600-mile journey back to the west coast of France to Nantes to embark for Ireland. But there's something, uh, again, I, mean, I see in Columban is something of the nature of the Apostle Paul, particularly in his relationship to his companion Mark. I mean, Columban and Gaul were, were very much closest of friends and colleagues. And here, just as Paul was shipwrecked, so Columbanus is shipwrecked and he sees that as a sign from God that his work in France is not finished. So he begins the long journey back east again, but avoiding, like Paul, areas of controversy. They couldn't go back down south, back down to the to Burgundy. So what what they did was they travelled east. They went out across cross country through Paris. Historian David Trainer once again. And on the way, Columba was healing different people. There were times where he would go in and he would preach to people in the prisons, and sometimes he would just let the prisoners go free, <laughs> as well. In all the life stories of the saints, you always get healing stories, miracle healing stories, and Columbanus was, was was no exception. So, uh, uh, having left Paris, eventually they they came across to the town of Metz, and the town of Metz was the the big capital there, and the the king of Austrasia was there, Theodebert, and Theodebert told them to go away down to find their seclusion, not down in Burgundy, but to go away down to what, what today we would call Switzerland. So the journey from Metz down to Switzerland is a beautiful journey. It's one that I've always, I would love to make it, down the, the beautiful river Moselle until they came to the town of Koblenz. And from there they had this magnificent sail all the way down, absolutely beautiful sail from Koblenz right down to Switzerland. It's one of the finest waterways in the world. I've seen a, a beautiful film made by Jacques Cousteau sailing down this in the boat, and it's absolutely beautiful part of the world. It's fam- passing the famous Lorelei, you know, the mermaid that, that sings sings all the sailors to the to their death. These are uncharted areas. Uh, you're going through hostile country very often. You're living on what you can beg, I'll not say steal probably, but certainly borrow or buy. Um, there must have been moments when, you know, it was perilous, simply physically perilous. Uh, they must have been hungry, cold and hungry. Uh, but nevertheless, there's this spirit of cheerful optimism undergirded by very strong Christian conviction. And uh, Columbanus even composes a song. So that as they row along, uh, they sing and, and add to the rhythm of the journey. So I don't know. It's, it's, you, get a, you get a sense nonetheless for all its arduousness. There is a fine spirit about the group. And you can imagine them going along the Rhine singing. Oh, little bark on twin horn rhyme from forest hewn to skin and brine. Heave leads and let the echoes ring. The tempest howl, the storms dismay, but mainly strength can win the day. Heave leads and let the echoes ring. 
For clouds and squalls will soon pass on And victory lie, work well done Heave lads and let the echoes ring Hold fast, survive, and all is well God sends you worst, he'll calm the swell Heave lads and let the echoes ring Also, at this stage, it's associated with the famous rowing song. You get this beautiful lilting song as they're as they're rowing their boat down against the current, of course, because the, the current the, the, the rain is running up towards the North Sea, so they, they're actually sailing up up river. The king of virtues vowed a prize for him who wins, for him who tries. Think, lad of God, and echo him. Think, lad of God, and echo him. Think, lad of God, and echo him. So how did Columbanus and his monks' travels through Europe progress? Historian David Trainer. They passed the town of Strasbourg, the town of Basel, the town of Schaffhausen, until eventually they come to Lake Constance. So they came to the Lake Constance, and when they get, got to Lake Constance, they rode across to the southeast of it. And again, it was an old Roman fort that they set up a monastery there in Bregenz. But the problem was, in this part of the world, there was a Celtic tribe there who were Germanic, and they were very, very, what we would call pagan. They were, they were non-Christian. They were the, the tribe of the, called the Alemanni, and they worshipped the god Woden, from whom we get the famous day, the, the word for Wednesday. And they worshipped Woden, and there was a lot of opposition there, and there was a few of the monks were actually murdered by them as well. So it was, it was quite, a, quite a difficult time they had there. A modern author, Ian Finlay, has said that for a group of Irish monks to go across a land like Switzerland, as it was when, when, the, when Columbanus and his monks arrived there, was the equivalent of a group of Christian missionaries travelling from Pakistan through the Khyber Pass into Afghanistan when the Taliban were ruling in full control. That was the parallel. And, and that's what it was like. Very, very dangerous. And some of the monks were actually murdered by the Alemanni when they went to Switzerland, Lake, Lake Constance. So that was the situation that they were in. They did stop in what we would call Switzerland, at the place at Bregenz. Early medieval historian Kate Tristram. Now, Columbanus eventually decided, although they did stay there for a while and found a monastery there, that he didn't like Bregenz. He wanted to get on further still. But one of his principal disciples, a man who'd come all the way from Ireland with him, St. Gaul, did like that particular place and thought that it would there was good missionary opportunity. It seems that St. Gaul was really rather good at languages and he was interested in learning the languages of the local people and communicating to them in that way. Anyway, when the moment came to depart from Brigance, it seems that St. Gaul felt ill and Columbanus didn't believe for a moment that he was really ill. He thought he was just, uh, uh, as it were, swinging the lead, you know. And so um, he quarrelled with Gaul at this point, left him behind because Gaul wouldn't move on, but uh, it told him that he must not celebrate the Eucharist, even though he was a priest, while he, while Columbanus, was alive. Now, this would have been, of course, a big um, problem for Gaul, he he did go on. He worked as a missionary. He founded a monastery, St. Gaul's, uh, as it's called, Gallen, later on. But it does seem that obedience was so much part of the whole Christian living of, of the Irish monks, obedience to God, obedience to the abbot, and so on, that he did not celebrate the Eucharist while Columbanus was alive. You have the side plot of Gaul as well then, who was his 
great companion. Gaw was another one of the famous students of, of Bangor and probably another one that was Congo was sorry to see go because he had a great potential. Gaul had the advantage of having the languages, so it was very important that they stuck together, uh, but they had a disagreement and they parted ways. Again, the stories differ as to the story there um, of what actually happened, but the, the the nicest one would be that Gaul had an illness that made him stay while Colin Bannis went on. Historian Leanne Briggs of the North Down Museum. Here's Bangor historian Tom Bold to continue the story. Gaul and Colin Bannis split. Gaul went into Switzerland and set up uh, a monastery in a, what is now known as St. Gallen. Gaul was always in the footsteps of Colin Bannis, but yet a man also of great wisdom. But there was a difference in their character. Colin Bannis was a go-getter. Uh, he was the, the leader Gaul was more the contemplative, quiet type. He was a man who liked solitude and was quite happy to head away off into forests or whatever and be in his own where he could pray, where he could meditate, uh, where he could study. But he, he hadn't that get up and go that Colin Bannis had. But I think part of the reason that Congal probably sent Gaul with Columbanus was because they supported each other. Columbanus, to some extent, needed somebody to lean on at times. Gaul certainly needed Columbanus for his knowledge and his instruction. And when Gaul split off, he too held to the rules of the old rule of Bangor, which was developed then by Columbanus. And as he moved up into Switzerland, he really became the development of the Christian church in Switzerland. He settled in around Lake Geneva, and really from that, his, his own monastery then, it flourished. And to hear more about the epic life of Columbanus, including how he survived the Alemanni tribes and how he wrote a stinker of a letter to the Pope and much more, then make sure to catch our next number 11 programme in this 12-part Back from the Brink series. This programme was made with the support of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, Songs by Cliff Wedgbury. Until our next programme, from myself, Paul Wright, bye for now. <laughs>